Welcome to Boating Tips Live with Marine Max, your weekly chat about boating products, service, safety, advice, and a whole lot more. Join the fun by submitting your boating questions answered on air by our knowledgeable captains. Without further ado, let's start the show. All right. Cool. Hey, guys. How's it going, everybody? How's it going, Jim? Pretty good. How are you guys today? Doing good. Ready for a big episode. Excellent. So, Glad we could join you. So I'm Captain Keith coming to you live from our Clearwater studios. As usual, got Captain Nick here with me today. John. And with us, we're very fortunate. He's been on with us probably about a year ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, James McCowan from Ray Marine. Welcome, Jim. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, man. Glad you're here. Hey, I, I, I got to tell you, though, I'm a little jealous of that studio. I think that this is the first time we've had somebody on here that's got like an actual podcast studio in action. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we uh, spent a little time earlier this spring setting this up uh, to try to do a little bit of webcasting ourselves. And uh, it's been a great learning process, but um, it all in all, it's actually been a fantastic way to connect with customers. And uh, we're real excited to have everybody join us uh, online and uh, share our knowledge with them. So how's that going? And when when can people see you on your podcast and stuff? Yeah, so our uh, broadcast is on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, we call it Raymarine Live. Um, <clears throat> for the summer months, we're actually now going to every other Thursday. So this particular Thursday is going to be an off week for us, and we'll be back the following week with our next episode. Um, but right now we've got, I think, uh, 13 episodes we've done so far uh, this season, and they're all up available on our uh, YouTube stream uh, as well, uh, youtube.com slash raymarine. Awesome. So cool. Today we're gonna be we're gonna be talking all things boating electronics, such a constantly changing world, especially since last year, even one year makes such a difference in the world of a marine electronics. It's crazy, just like you know, even thinking back to the Raymarine E120s, which doesn't seem that too long ago, and, and they were just state of the art ridiculous bottom machines, ridiculous charts and stuff like that. And now we look at them and it's just like, we don't even recognize them year to year, you know, with the Axiom, Axiom Pro and stuff like that. And, and on top of the basics of a, you know, the unit itself, Raymarines really came such a long way between the whole FLIR deal and stuff like that. There's, you know, definitely at the cutting edge. So there's going to be no shortage of questions today and topics to go to cover so definitely looking forward to going down that road with you and and kind of talking about what we're working with here in 2021 awesome. pandemic if you will bunch of stuff we can cover but we've already got some awesome questions coming in yep. on youtube and facebook guys if there's ever an episode to ask a question this is it we're going to be taking those questions and chances are keith and i might not know something about the technical stuff, especially when you start talking about a lot of this more complicated electronics talk, but we've got the guy that can do it. So um, I guess first things first, you got some good questions coming yep. in on Facebook, Keith? Yeah, well, right here, we're just going to roll down the line here. It's actually over on your platform there, I think, with uh, Sam Hunt. Jim, he wants to know, um, what KW do your open radars come in? Oh, yeah, that's actually a, a great question, Sam. So we are open array radars. Uh, they're called Magnum. That's the name of our, our product line for open array. Uh, we have them in a four kilowatt or a 12 kilowatt uh, open array. And you also have a choice of a four foot or a six foot antenna on that platform. So you do have some options and some flexibility there. Um, there's some features that are common uh, to, to both of them, kind of regardless of what power uh, output you go with and what size antenna. Um, but they are all dual speed uh, capable. They do 24 or 48 RPMs. So they go into high speed mode uh, for tracking targets that are in close to the boat. You get a more steady update rate. Um, they have bird mode for when you go offshore and you're fishing, you're looking for those uh, seabirds that are diving in on the bait fish. Um, it has a bird mode that you can turn right on. Um, of course, it's a fantastic tool for collision avoidance and coastal navigation and fog navigation and all that stuff too. So, so 
what's the difference between a open array and a closed array on on the on these boats? Oh, sorry. Hold on one second, guys. I'm losing your audio again. Uh oh. So, a little technical difficulty. So, so an can open. You back. Can you hear me? An open array radar. Well, the open array is going to scare really seagulls away, right? <laughs> so <laughs> never fails, right? As soon as we start. Right. There we go. I got you Are back you, now. You back in here? Yes, sir. Okay. I was just asking, kind of like, is there a difference in power, or what's the difference between an open array and a closed uh, dome? Sure, yeah. So the closed array ray domes, uh, the smaller uh, domes, they're either 18 or 24 inches in diameter. So Is inside that the dome. You right there, Jim? Uh, sorry, what's that? Oh, Is yeah, that yeah. Yep. So we have, for example, a quantum behind us. A quantum is about an 18 inch uh, radar platform. Um, so inside there, there is an antenna uh, similar to an open array that spins around. It's just inside the dome, so you don't see it turning, but, it, but it's in there. Um, as you move up from an 18 inch to a 24 inch to a 48 inch or even a 60 inch radar, um, what the size of that antenna does is it gives you a higher definition and it gives you more sensitivity. Um, so if you think about the way that a radar works is it blasts a pulse of microwave energy out to the horizon. And that could be anywhere from 24 to 48 or even 96 miles out. Um, wow. So when that signal comes back, it's pretty weak, right? It's, it's traveled some serious distance. So the bigger the antenna, uh, the more of that returning signal we can suck into the system. We also use the size of that, um, that antenna to focus the beam on the way out. So with a bigger antenna, it's kind of like having a bigger lens and we can make a much tighter microwave beam that gives us more detail. Cool. I just learned something. Yeah. So, so I, I guess what, what differences does it make, you know, on like the, let's, let's dig a little bit more in depth. You said that all these radars are going to have two speeds or two functions on them. What, what, what would you use one for in each scenario? I mean, yeah, so the open array radars and our two, uh, we call them HD color radomes, they, they're all dual speed capable. Um, so mm -hmm. typically a radar turns at 24 RPM, uh, but there might be times when you want the radar to spin faster so that it updates targets uh, more quickly. And usually that has to do with speed. So either your boat is running at high speed, so you want the targets around the boat on the radar scope to update more quickly. You're getting more uh, painting of their positions on the scope so you can see them uh, at a faster rate. Uh, or um, the targets around you themselves are moving at high speed um, when you, you might not be, but they're moving very fast. So if they're coming at you quickly, you also want the radar to be able to update uh, very quickly to see their position over and over again. Um, so, that, so that allows the radar basically to speed up from 24 to 48 RPMs. So we're getting double the scans on any particular target uh, as it's uh, moving past the radar scanner. Interesting. Let's talk about the, the radar overlay too on some of the charts. I mean, you use them a lot, yep. whether it's for channel markers, land. Collision avoidance, collision like I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Sure. How accurate do you find yeah. that? Um, it, it actually should be very accurate on, yeah. on every system that runs it. So what radar overlay does is it takes that live radar picture, uh, it drops it in on top of your navigation chart. And we use a couple of different sensors on board the boat to align that. Um, we use the GPS basically to figure out where the center of the picture is, right? We know where the boat is on the chart. We know that the radar is coming off of that, that boat in that position. So we use that as the center point of the radar image. And then on top of that, we use either the boat's heading uh, system, which typically comes from an autopilot. So we use its compass uh, to align the image so we know which way the radar is pointed in relation to the bow of the boat. Uh, or in the absence of a, a heading sensor, maybe you have a smaller boat that doesn't have an autopilot or an electronic compass, then we can use the course over ground signal coming off of the GPS uh, when the boat is moving. Um, and that will help us to align that picture. Um, but you should get a, a pretty accurate um, representation of the land and the shoreline and, and other boats and buoys and things um, right on top of one another on that overlay image. And yeah, the overlay, pretty useful the overlay was right, for the overlay for, for weather too is just is phenomenal. I mean, I don't know how many times it saved my butt. I'm running up Tampa Bay or going somewhere and you got storms coming and you can, you can sit there and track them and you can see where it's painted right on top of the chart. 
and you can find a little hole and you can shoot right through, you know, whether to slow down or speed up and, uh, and, and go around that. I will tell you one thing though, too, sometimes if you do have your, your radar overlay and if you're just setting up your system, I found that sometimes it's going to be skewed a little bit. It might be a few degrees off. Mm -hmm. So when you go into the menu and you go into advanced settings and then there's the bearing that you can adjust. And so if you tweak that, like we've got a, like a seven degree, six to seven degree offset here, a variation magnetic. So I can go in there and kind of swing that radar around a little bit to where it actually does draw right on top of the chart. So if you can find a bridge or something straight, if it's not pinging right on top of that object, go into your settings and you can tweak it to where it'll be right, right dead on. Yeah, that, and that's a great tip. You do have that bearing alignment and usually that bearing alignment calibration um, on some boats, it's not always possible to get the radar like right on the center or even to get it straight over the bow. So that allows you to yeah create a yep. couple of degrees of correction. Um, another way you can align it too is if you do have that digital compass on board, whether it's standalone or part of the pilot, uh, usually in the compass calibration, you can add or subtract a couple of degrees to the heading and that'll also bring it into alignment. Looks like Anthony Armeo is probably uh, stalking us on here. I see the Marine. Oh, Mac I'm sure he is. Up there. He, goes, <laughs> yeah. he goes. There's. He's all fired up. He goes. There's the dream team. <laughs> He's all. Yeah, fired we up. have we had Anthony on here. Did they ever we, get we have built some pretty amazing Ray Marine boats with Anthony and his guys over there in Pompano. Yeah, man. Yeah. Speaking of which, are you guys going to be at at Ibex this year with the uh, with the Marine Max fishing team boat? We are definitely going to be at Ibex. Um, we don't have the boat situation quite hammered out, but I sure hope that we could bring it over there. That would be really cool. We definitely uh, had it at the last Ibex, which I guess is two years ago now. Yeah, uh, since we skipped a year. Um, we had uh, the boat there set up with uh, some pretty neat technologies on it. We had our, our dock sense alert system actually running on that boat, which is our uh, assisted docking cameras. Um, so that was a, a fun way to show those off. And uh, that boat also had, well, it had that 12 kW radar that we were just talking about. It had uh, the new FLIR on it, um, and it was running a big set of axioms on there. So one more question before we get into the viewer questions here. Let's talk about dock sense a little bit, because I remember probably only two years ago, somebody, it was even like a joke, like, oh, what are you going to have, self-docking boats next? And now here we are, we got dock sense. Sorry, bear and, with me, guys. I'm losing your audio again. It dropped out right as you started asking the question. Uh, I'm not sure what is going on with it. Oh, he'll, he'll, he'll it stays get nice and back. clear for a few seconds, and then it drops out. He'll get us back. We're going to be talking about uh, dock sense, which dock sense is exactly what it sounds like. It is not a joke, It right? It, you know, you've seen the videos of these boats almost docking themselves. Yeah. Well, I, don't I, know, well, I don't know what we're going to do once people have boats that dock themselves. Know, I we're saw it at that. Ibex. Yeah, so the DockSense is a pretty cool system. So uh, at Ibex, we had DockSense Alert, which, if you will, is kind of sort of the basic um, uh, application. So we're using um, a set of cameras that are they're called stereo vision cameras. So just like, just like our heads, <laughs> these cameras have two uh, lenses on them. They have a left and a right, and that gives them depth perception. Um, so these cameras just looking out over whatever portion of the boat they're covering can very precisely measure the distance to objects around the boat. Um, so we send that back to a processor unit that builds that into um, kind of a complete image of what's going on around the vessel. And we show it, um, it looks very similar to a radar scope um, in how it is generated and it draws out the, the dock and it draws out pilings and other objects around the boat. Uh, and it color codes them actually according to how high they are off the water. So we get a, an idea of the height uh, of things. Um, but the DocSense system can measure, um, you know, within fractions of an inch, the distance to objects. So we can actually set up a virtual bumper zone around the boat that we want to maintain. And the system will provide audible and visible cues when we're closing too fast in any one direction on one of those objects. We have a second um, tier of that product called DocSense Control that we showed off at the Miami Boat Show a few years ago. Also, um, we had it on a Boston Whaler uh, there. It was pretty neat. Uh, and that one goes to the next level where it actually integrates uh, the boat's propulsion um, into the system. So it will it'll actually intervene to prevent you from colliding with things. It has dynamic positioning on it. Um, it'll see you know, that there's a piling or a dock or whatever. And if you're closing too fast, it'll start backing off the engines automatically and it'll maintain whatever that virtual bumper distance is. 
Um, so that's an awesome technology that we continue to work on. Uh, we were working on it with a lot of different uh, partners in the industry. I, I always make this joke and I make it every day and anybody that works with me rolls their eyes, but I always say that, uh, that joystick piloting put captains out of business. So that's why I had to move into sales and I might need to tweak that a little bit when we've got doc sense going on. Yeah. The doc sense takes it even to a whole new level. The joystick is great and it's enabled so many people to get into boating that might've been scared to do it before. And uh, doc sense is going to bring the rest of the people that are still scared, even more scared in because yeah, it, right. it really, uh, it, you know, one of the things we kind of say about it is that, you know, it prevents expensive damage and it prevents embarrassment to the captain too, right? Because nope, nobody wants to yeah. be the guy that bangs into somebody else's boat. It happens. We, uh, we've got a phenomenal amount of viewers on YouTube right now. So thanks everybody for watching. We've got about 75 people tuning in on the YouTube stream. And we've got some great questions already that we're going to dive into. We've got two awesome ones from Patrick. Uh, first one is, Patrick McCrink says, what is the best way to use open air, open array radar for finding diving birds? So how do you tweak that a little bit? And then, then? and also what range and what to look, what's, what's it going to look like? What, what to look for? Sure. Yeah. So uh, with an open array radar, so we'd be talking to any of our Magnum uh, open arrays, uh, have the bird mode capability um, as well. Our, our 18 and 24 inch HD color radomes have the capability as well. Um, so to actually activate it um, on your Axiom in your radar mode, you just tap the menu button up on the corner of the screen and you'll see a radar mode that's predefined called bird mode. So you just touch it and that's going to automatically adjust the settings um, to their best possible uh, configuration for hunting birds. So what it basically does is it brings the gain of the radar system up very, very high. The gain is kind of its sensitivity level. So now it's looking for very, very small, uh, distinct targets. Um, it also automatically manages the sea clutter. So we're trying to filter out the wave tops. We're trying to filter out noise from other things around and just get those birds in the air. Um, as for what they look like, they tend to look like a blue uh, cluster, um, almost like a cloud. Um, so you'll see that, um, that color kind of emphasized uh, out on the horizon. And range wise, it's gonna vary a little bit depending on the radar that you're using, but you can generally see birds anywhere from three to sometimes 12 miles. Wow. Um, depending on how big the flock is. Yeah, super, super, super game changer there with your eye in the sky or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> you got another question here from Joe Tucker yeah. that says, what should boaters do with electronics during a lightning storm? Go lightning, by the way. And Yeah, they lost last night. Yeah, but... Uh, what should boaters do with electronics during a lightning storm? So I guess this could kind of be a multi-level question here. One, how can you use your electronics to avoid a lightning storm? Mm -hmm. And two, I guess that's a question that we get a lot is, does the electricity in the air, in the air can that wig out your marine electronics? We get questions about lightnings on lightning on boats all the time. Maybe, Keith, you can share some stories too but basically to answer joe's question what do you do with your electronics during a lightning storm i mean are there ways that you can kind of tweak that radar or whatever so um initially um radar is actually a really good tool for seeing a thunderstorm as it's moving in um because th uh, the clouds for a thunderstorm are so high in the air you can see them usually all the way out at the maximum range of whatever your radar is too so you'll have you know, 24 miles or more of advanced warning if you're looking, um, you know, looking out, if, if you're expecting there might be bad weather that day, it's a good idea to check periodically out at that max range and see what's coming. Um, another good tool that ties in with that too is that we support the uh, Sirius XM uh, Marine Weather Service on our MFDs too. So that has Doppler weather radar as well. So either way, you can kind of see what's coming um, and you can come up with a plan to try to try to drive around it if possible. Um, you know, unless you need the freshwater wash down, it's probably best to stay out of the, out of the thunderstorms. Um, once you're in <laughs> the thunderstorms, um, you know, because every now and again, they are going to catch you. Um, what really comes into play are a couple of settings on the radar, the gain um, and the, um, there's a rain clutter uh, control. So the drops of, of rain coming down at thunderstorm intensity, they are going to create a return uh, on the radar. 
Um, so there is a filter in there that we can use to eliminate rain from the display. So you can go in and turn that on, crank it up a little bit. Uh, sometimes you will have to drop the gain down just a little bit, but for the most part, the system auto tunes um, and kind of detects that, but the rain clutter is something you will want to manually uh, have a play with. Um, of course, the other side of, of electronics in a thunderstorm too is that when you start to get a lot of electricity in the air around the boat, you know, the big question is, you know, what, what potential damage can uh, a lightning strike do to electronics? And let's just say it's, it's not good, right? If your boat Damn does it. happen to take a hit, um, there's, there's not a whole lot you can do with regard to turning your electronics on or turning them off. That's really going to make a big difference. Um, you know, there, there's certain things that we build into them in the first place in terms of grounding and bonding that hopefully if they're installed correctly, they're grounded the best they can be, which kind of sets them up at least in the best possible position they can be. in. if the boat does take a hit, then it may not wipe everything out, but lightning is uh, a nasty creature, um, when it comes to the electricity on a boat. Have you ever been in a boat that's been struck, Keith? No, I mean it's been close. I mean, I've yeah. you hear you know fishing rods humming and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that. But you know, I mean, I would say like your VHF antenna, you know, go ahead and lay it down. You know, your outrigger. I mean, all that stuff. Just kind of get a low profile. You know, as that best certainly you can, makes sense. Right? Yeah, yeah. Anything you can get down. You know, <laughs> you, you never want to be the highest object out there because you're just asking for it. So I guess, yeah, whatever yeah. you can do to get it down, as long as, as long as you're not already into it, you know, I don't know that if, if the lightning is already flashing around you, I probably wouldn't want to be touching any of that stuff, trying to get, trying to knock it down. Yeah. Right. 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 It's another one of your YouTube questions here. Um, yeah. Go ahead take it, Keith. It's uh, something that does, does have any impact on limiting or mitigating electromagnetic radiation. So I guess he's probably talking about, you know, coming out of the, the radar unit itself. Sure. Yeah. And that's actually a real common question we get. And it's, it's, um, it's something that gets misconstrued quite a bit uh, as well. Okay. So with a radar, it does transmit microwave energy. Um, and when people hear microwave energy, they don't automatically think of a microwave oven and, you know, making a burrito or, you know, heating up their, their chili that was left over from last night. Um, so you can't do that on a radome? You, you, <laughs> you, can't? you can't. Well, put it this way. You can't do it on a, a Ray Marine radar. Um, uh, the, the types of radar that we are running are powerful, um, but not of the caliper that are going to, you know, be reheating food or repeat, reheating people standing in front of it. Um, so what makes Marine radar a little bit different from a microwave oven um, a microwave oven uses what they call continuous wave energy. So when you turn it on for your 90 seconds to heat up your, your burrito, right, it is, it is pulsing at one kilowatt for 90 seconds straight at that object in the center. Um, the radar energy is actually pulsed. Um, so it actually turns itself on and off thousands of times per second. And that's what actually allows the radar to look down uh, bearings, right? If we left it on continuously, we'd actually just get like one giant lobby picture. But by pulsing it, it's actually, you know, looking down a bearing, looking down a bearing, looking down a bearing, looking down a bearing and going, you know, round and round. And it turns that into a picture. But all that pulsing also means that it never generates enough energy on any one given target to actually heat it up with that microwave energy. Now, when you're installing a radar on a boat, um, yes, you do want to have some, some kind of common sense you know, safety concerns. You do want to get that radar mounted up above where your passengers are normally going to be. Um, not only just to keep them out of the beam just for good measure, uh, but also in the case of an open array, for example, you don't want it, you know, down where people are going to get hit by it, or it's going to be knocking into fishing rods or all this other stuff. You, when it's moving, um, it moves, you know, with a pretty good amount of force. And uh, so you don't want anybody to get, you know, bonked in the head with it or anything like that. Um, so it is good practice to get the radar up and above everybody's head level. You know, of, of all the of all the, your tissues in your body, your eyes are actually the most sensitive to microwave energy. Um, but uh, but keep it up above head level, and you'll be fine. Okay. So we had a lot of questions on radar. We spent quite a bit of time on radar. Um, how about with FLIR, and then tying that in with the augmented reality aspect of it, as far as you know, being able to see things out there. Sure. Yeah. So the FLIR is a really cool uh, technology. Um, FLIR is uh, infrared uh, night vision. 
Um, though what is neat about infrared is that it works during the day as well as at night. So um, anytime you have any kind of obstructed visibility, whether it's darkness, uh, whether it is glare, um, the thermal camera can actually see through those conditions and detect targets out on the horizon. Um, a lot of the FLIR cameras that we sell also have visible cameras on them as well. So in addition to that thermal uh, capability, you have a high definition color camera. Um, some of them have quite substantial zoom uh, capability on them as well. So they're, they're stabilized. Um, they work even better in many cases than a pair of you know, expensive stabilized binoculars. Um, yeah. You have this massive zoom capability, fully stabilized, and you have it on a big screen uh, right on your helm. Um, augmented reality is a cool technology that we brought out a couple of years ago that ties in all these different types of sensors. Um, so you have your FLIR with its thermal or visible camera. You can also have other fixed cameras on board the boat tied into the augmented reality system. And what we do is we take that live view looking forward or after in, in whatever direction, and we overlay on top of it um, the data from your AIS system, your automatic identification system. So when you see a boat on the horizon, if he's got an AIS transmitter, you see the boat and you see a little flag on top of him. It'll have the name of the boat. And it'll have his bearing and range and you can touch him and get other, other details about him. We can also show your waypoints uh, overlaid on the live uh, picture. So maybe you have all your fishing spots and you're you know, looking out over the bay and you can't decide where you want to go or you know, what's the best direction to get there through all the traffic that's in front of me. Well, now you can actually see your waypoint out there on the horizon and you can see where it is in relation to all the other stuff uh, that's out there in the camera view. Um, so that's a pretty neat uh, capability uh, as well. It really uh, ties everything back together. And, and you, yeah. you take that back to being out there at night. And now all of a sudden, you know, that kind of mystery ship that's out there on the horizon, um, we have a flag that points it out and it has a name. So if you maybe needed to call him on your VHF, you can certainly do that. Um, we see buoys and nav aids in, in the augmented reality as well. So you, maybe you can't quite see the actual position of the buoy with your eyes, but we're going to show you with augmented reality where it's supposed to be. And then, you know, on a foggy day, uh, you'll see it in the augmented reality, and then it'll break through the fog, you know, right where you're hoping it's going to be. That's the thing I love most about Raymarine is we deal a lot with other manufacturers and, and they're all great. And you've got certain guys and girls that are married to certain brands and stuff like that. But the one thing that I think that just about nobody yeah, can I argue lost with your Raymarine, voice again uh, there, Captain Nick, just pause one yeah, second. Going to count, going to count to 10, one, gotcha. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's not bad one. Um, Anyway, what I was saying was I don't think that anybody can really dispute that Raymarine does the best job of tying everything together from the radar overlay to the FLIR, to the augmented reality. Everything is so integrated, and, and Raymarine does a great job of integrating everything into just kind of one, and it's all talking to each other yeah. seamlessly. Yeah, and that's something that really goes back to uh, our earliest days. Um, we originally pioneered – um, kind of the notion of an integrated system when we, we started way back in the late 80s with our SeaTalk uh, system. And that just enabled the boat's real basic navigation sensors to talk uh, to one another. And all of a sudden your radar you know, was aware of GPS and, and Loran back in the day. And your sailing instruments you know, on a sailboat could talk to everything else. And it just kind of grew from there. We expanded the ability to network you know, sonar and radar and then cameras and FLIR and and now we're at the point where all of the boat systems can be totally integrated. So we can see engine data. Um, we can do digital switching. Um, so we can control a lot of the electrical systems on board the boat, you know, through a nice graphical interface uh, and tie that right in. Um, so it's, you know, almost the sky's the limit in terms of what you can integrate nowadays. Very exciting time to be building a new boat or buying a new boat. Oh, I know. I know. While we wait for some other questions to come in, one thing that I wanted to talk about, the only thing that's more, I guess, confusing than radars and all the questions that you can get in the different settings and stuff like that is let, let, let's go in and talk about for a segment here of all things transducers. You've mm -hmm. seen that game change a lot over the past few years from just your standard traditional view we're talking. I lost you again. Hold on. One, two, three. Come on, we can't lose him for more than five seconds. And he's back, right? You're back. Yeah, he's back. 
Gotcha now. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <That's> weird. <laughs> so let's talk about transducers and stuff. We've come a long way from traditional view. We're talking side scans, down views, all sorts of different stuff. Now, different settings on your transducers. 3D. 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 Chirp. Chirp, through-haul transducers, transoms out transducers. Let's let's kind of dive into that world really quick. And, and what a different trans what one, what a transducer is, two, mm -hmm. what the different transducers are gonna do for you, all those settings and stuff. I think to me as a fisherman, that's the most exciting thing out of all these advancements that we've seen. And I know that Raymarine's leading a charge and all that. So let's dive right in. Sure, yeah. So first off, what does the transducer actually do? So the transducer is a device that actually takes sound energy in the water and turns it into electrical energy that we can read with a computer. Um, so we, we basically generate a high voltage pulse uh, in our depth sounder. We send it down to the transducer and the transducer inside actually has um, a piece of ceramic. It almost looks like a hockey puck in there. And we can shape them into different shapes. Some of them are round, some of them are tubular, depending on what we want the beam to do. But when we strike that piece of ceramic with high voltage electricity, it actually rings. It makes a, a pinging sound. Um, and it generally makes it at a frequency that's higher than what humans can hear. Though you might be able to hear a little bit of a mechanical kind of tick tock sound off your transducers if you get real close to them. But when that sound goes into the water, it travels very, very rapidly to the bottom and it reflects off of anything in the way. So if there's fish between the transducer and the bottom, they will reflect energy back up. And of course the ocean bottom will reflect energy back up. So the transducer then kind of flips into its receiving mode. And that piece of ceramic basically reacts to those little tiny signals coming back. So when those sound signals hit the ceramic, it vibrates. We turn that back into an electrical impulse and then the, the computer turns it into a picture. So uh, you mentioned uh, chirp as a technology, and that's something that's come uh, um, online really in the last, you know, probably say seven years um, and has exploded kind of all through all aspects of sonar. So um, originally sonar used what we call a discrete frequency. So you'd have a particular sound frequency that it would transmit into the water. And it was typically 200 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz if you're in deeper water, maybe even down at 28 kilohertz in, in very deep water. Um, and, and sometimes even lower than that if you had a, a real big system or commercial grade system. Um, but if you could hear it with your ear, which generally you can't, but if you could, it would be a, a steady, constant tone. So it would just be like ping, ping, ping. You know, think of like the World War II submarine movie, right? Yeah. The, the destroyers over the top of the crew and they're all sweating it out down there. Listen to that pinging sound. <laughs> yeah. So what, um, what Chirp technology does is it actually uses um, a, a band of frequencies. So instead of just that single pinging sound over and over again, if you could hear it with your ear, it would sound more like a siren um, on an emergency vehicle. So it actually whelps across a wide range of frequencies. And what that does is it gives us significantly more resolution and more detail in the image. So when you compare a, a standard sonar with a chirp sonar side by side, um, the chirp sonar generally is going to be able to pick out individual fish uh, in a school. So you'll see lots of detail. Um, the bottom uh, structure identified on a chirp sonar is going to tend to have more lifelike presentation, finer kind of granularity of the, um, the nooks and crannies and everything that's, uh, that's going on down there. Um, and then on top of that, the sonar can actually run uh, many different uh, frequencies. Um, the lower frequencies go farther uh, or deeper into the water. The higher frequencies um, give us uh, shorter range but higher resolution. Um, so we can, we can chirp across low band frequencies and see certain things. We can chirp at on the high band frequencies and see other things. Uh, but the level of detail, um, today is absolutely stunning. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about side scan a little bit too there. That's a huge game changer around here. It, side scan is something that's kind of tough to explain sometimes on how it works and exactly what it's showing, what the scope is. Um, side scan is huge around here. For instance, all of our tarpon guys, yep. it is a must mm -hmm. have. It is a must have. Now, you know, you might not even be aware of a whole school of fish that's 20, 20 feet or so off of your, one of the sides of your boat that you wouldn't 
catch on a traditional system. And how does that work? And where did that kind of all come from, from seeing what's on the side of the boat and kind of explaining what it's reading and how it's reading it? Sure. Yeah. So the side scan technology, basically we're taking that traditional down looking sonar and we're rotating it 90 degrees. So we're now shooting it horizontally uh, through the water, usually at a slight downward angle because there tends to be a lot of noise right at the surface, yeah. right? You got boat wakes and the wave chop and whatnot. So we tilt it just a little bit below the surface, but we shoot it horizontally through the water and we can technically get about 300 feet of range out of the side vision. So definitely, you know, as, as far or farther than you can cast, um, we can actually scan with a side vision uh, transducer. We use um, a chirp frequency for it. We, uh, we use 350 kilohertz as the center of our chirping band. So it goes from 320 to 380. Um, and that gives us very high resolution on it. So we can typically see uh, uh, individual fish in a school. Um, if there happens to be a man-made object down there, maybe there's a, a wreck or um, an artificial reef or whatever, we can get a, a nice detailed picture of that as well because of the chirp uh, technology. Um, but it's, it is really cool because it is truly looking out from the, uh, wherever the transducer is mounted uh, horizontally uh, through the water. So it's actually going to measure off um, the distance to whatever those targets are. Um, so it gives you an idea of how far you have to cast to see something or to hit something. Yeah, I love the I love the the side scan stuff. So like on my deliveries and stuff, well, you know, we go underneath the bridge out here and you can see all the columns, all the different pilings. You can see the, you know, the fenders, you can see the concrete back behind those fenders. Um, I've gone through there, uh, went over top of a dolphin, and you can just see, I mean, the perfect <laughs> you can see the flip you can see yeah. flipper. You can just see the perfect outline of of you know of of what it was. It's it's pretty amazing, yeah. Some of the some of the fish image really really well. Tarpon or another one, they're just like oh, yeah. they're they're unmistakable. I mean, they're they're big to start with. They're big meaty muscular fish, but their their sonar return is uh, very distinct. Yeah. All right. So so that's the side scan part of it. Then you've also got the three D. Yeah. So and I mean, a couple years ago, you and I did a video on it with the three D and stuff like that. I still personally am still trying to wrap my head. I still struggle with the 3D part of it. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain how it works, what I'm looking for? And if I go over a spot and if I turn around and come back over it again, will that keep building in more definition on what I'm looking at down there? It does. Yeah. So um, the Real Vision 3D system that we have on Axiom, um, what it does is it combines together our down vision channel, which is high definition down looking sonar. Um, it takes the side vision, um, which is also in HD. It combines your left, your right, and your down beams together. Um, okay. So now they're working as one. And then inside those transducers, there's a couple of other sensors in play. Um, there are two um, three-dimensional reference elements um, that activate when we're in 3D mode. So every time these, these sonars ping, we would normally just get a range, like a distance uh, to, an ob to an object, and we get the echo coming back, and we, we could figure out how far away it was. Um, but now we have two receivers. So we, we have two reference points to measure from, and that en enables us to actually establish where that target is in 3D space. So not only do we know how far away it is, uh, but we know how deep it is um, as well and what bearing it's on. So that, that's how we can actually build that model very accurately of what's in the water column. And our 3D system uh, will go anywhere from three, sometimes to 600 feet, depending on the water conditions, but 300 feet is a pretty reliable uh, number. Um, and it can basically scan in all directions uh, to as deep as the water is in 3D. So if you're in 100 feet of water, um, your 3D scan is gonna be about 100 feet uh, in all directions, 180 degrees. Um, from port to starboard underneath the boat. If it gets into deeper water, 300 feet, then you're going to be able to see out to about 300 feet in all directions. But generally, it's equal to whatever the water depth is. I don't have any on Facebook. Um, I, I, I see you writing questions down. Oh, no, there. no. I was just taking notes. I was writing <laughs> notes down for, for my stuff. I'm learning stuff. Hey, we've got some awesome questions coming in here. Bob, Tim, I see your questions. We're going to get to those in a minute. But before we move on from transducers, Jim, let's let's explain the difference in situations where people are going to install, a, for instance, a transom mount transducer or mm -hmm. a through-haul transducer. 
Uh, what's what's the difference in those? What is it going to what differences are you going to notice for what you're trying to accomplish? Sure. Yeah. So um, first of all, let's talk about the physical position. So a transom mount transducer, as as its uh, name suggests, mounts on the transom of the boat. So it is normally screwed into the transom or into the back of one of the steps, if it's a step tall. Um, but it uh, it hangs off the back of the boat. Um, and in many cases, it'll give you a pretty decent picture. Um, mm -hmm. But depending on how much turbulence and how much air your boat generates when it's moving at speed, um, on some vessels, a transom mount transducer can be challenging to tune in. Um, when the transducer sends that sound energy into the water, the one thing that will stop that that sound energy just cold is air bubbles. Um, so when we mount a transom mount transducer, we're looking for a position on the transom where the water flow coming off the boat is very, very clean, um, where we don't have um, a lots of air or bubbles or other kind of cavitation, uh, cavitated water flowing under the transducer because the sound energy just can't penetrate that. Um, when we're mounting a transom mount transducer, we always want to be aware of what's ahead of it. Um, what on the bottom of the boat is there. So if there is something that sticks out that might create a bubble stream, uh, if there's a, an overboard discharge maybe that's in line with that transducer and the water that it, it, it shoots out of the discharge is not going to be as smooth as the other water flowing down the hull. So that can create an issue. So we'll move it a little bit inboard or a little bit outboard to, to steer it into um, a nice clean spot. Um, a through hull transducer is the other alternative. And that kind of takes all of these wash issues and, and for the most part, eliminates them. So with a through-haul transducer, that's a sensor that is actually drilled through the bottom of the boat and it mounts um, uh, through that hole and it sits on the hull uh, underneath. It's forward of the engines, it's forward of the transom, um, and it's kind of down at the, the part of the boat that's deepest in the water where the water flow is generally the smoothest. Now, again, some hulls may have hull steps that by design are trying to put air under the boat. So we want to avoid those areas, even with a through hull transducer, because again, if we get air over the face of it, that is going to give it some trouble uh, registering a, a depth or a picture. Um, but, um, you know, um, another consideration, I guess, for when you go one way or the other is, um, is the boat in the water all the time or is it trailered? Um, a through hull transducer, if you're going to put it on a boat that's trailered, you have to make sure that its position um, is in such a place that it's not going to get hung up on the bunks and the rollers and things on the boat trailer. Uh, it's not going to get knocked off, you know, by the trailer structure when you're bringing the boat out of the water. So there's a little bit of consideration that goes in there. Um, it is possible to use either transducer um, on a trailer boat, um, but you definitely have to give it a little bit more thought if you're going to go through hull uh, on a boat with a trailer. There's another alternative too um, that are getting better and better all the time. And those are in hull transducers, where if you have a boat that has a solid fiberglass hull or it has a spot on the hull that they put, they mold specifically with solid fiberglass to accommodate this, the transducer actually mounts inside the boat. Um, hmm. And it's basically got like a little tank that's full of uh, liquid. Usually it's water or some kind of a non-toxic antifreeze. And the, the transducer sits in that little well and it transmits right through the fiberglass. The fiberglass is almost invisible to it. Oh, wow. So that works pretty well. You'll see that mostly for the higher powered chirp uh, transducers. So a lot of the fishing applications that they might be at high power, like one kilowatt or two kilowatt uh, transducers. Um, but it's a nice way to get a transducer in very easily to not have to drill any holes uh, in the boat. Um, you don't have to worry about any appendages or anything hanging off the bottom of the boat. It's all kind of carried internally, uh, but you do have to have solid fiberglass underneath for that to work. Yeah. So that's a great segue because that's Bob Smith actually had asked that question here uh, down here on the on the screen here. But and previously, though, uh, Bob also at, wants to know, is there sonar that will look forward of the boat for strictly uh, navigating shallow waters and leave it much leave you more reaction time when you come up on a steep grade? Yeah, this is a great question, Bob. This is one that we get all the time. And this is a technology that is out there, um, I will be honest and say that Raymarine does not have this technology in its portfolio, that it's something that we're always looking at all the time. One of the reasons that we don't have it in our portfolio is that this is, this is probably the hardest sonar technology of all to be implemented because um, a customer's expectation level for what this sonar has to do is very, very high, right? You want to use this for collision avoidance to not run aground when you're running at speed. 
uh, when the reality is this technology that, that as it is out there now works very well, uh, but it is primarily for low speed applications. So you can't be running it, uh, you know, a full clip down the bay and then, you know, be alerted hundreds of feet in advance to shallow water so that you have time to slow down. Um, so it is out there. Uh, we don't make it at the moment, uh, but there are some options out there. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If you've got your chart plotter set up correctly, you know, like I'll go through if it's a Navionics card or the Lighthouse or whatever, and you can select your depths or set up your, your depth um, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So basically what I'll do is I'll have anything that's six foot or deeper in white. Then the light blue is like six to three and the dark blue is three or less running around most of the places. I mean, you may not even, there's no channel markers out here in Tampa Bay or anything, but you know, you keep that boat in a white background. You're going to know, I don't care what boat I got here. I got, I can run it, you know, cause that's depths at low tide. Yeah. So, you know, you see as you're going along, if you got a course over ground vector turned on or a heading vector, you know, what's ahead of you, you know, you see that dark color coming up, you know, you're going to go ahead and slow down and you know, then you start watching your sonar, watch your depth and all that stuff. I wouldn't at all at speed be relying on some sort of sensor shooting out the front of it. Now, like you said, there are other options, other manufacturers and stuff like that. I mean, the Bass Masters was just this weekend over in Texas, right? And those guys on their bass boats, mm -hmm. pretty incredible. You know, they can sit there and see up, you know, brush piles and, but they're sitting still, they're dead yes. in the water and looking through and, you know, you can see, you know, a log that's fallen down and you can see fish that are suspended and stuff like that. But that's strictly, you know, looking under docks and things like that. That's not at all up on top, you know, or even running along, you know, they're not relying on that for that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is a pretty cool technology, but as you stated, they're standing still when they're doing that and, and doing it at a speed is really where the, the challenge is. Um, most of the sonars that are out there now, and I mean, and a good example, if, if, Bob wants to take a look. Um, there's a company called Far Sounder. They have some awesome videos of their product in action. And their, their product can actually be integrated with our product too. You can, through a video in, you can display it on your Raymarine MFD and, and tie it all in um, to kind of get that seamless experience. Um, but the transducers for it are rather large. Um, they need a special mounting position on the hull. They have to be fairly deep down in the water so that even when the boat is running you know, at whatever your normal cruising speed is, that transducer has got to be down where the water is very, very clean and clear. Um, you just think about the amount of turbulence and wash on the bow of a boat. Um, that, that's why this is such a uh, tricky thing to, to implement. But there are, there are some solutions out there um, and, and they're definitely worth a look, but uh, it is important to know kind of what the limitations of them are as well. Yeah. So he's also asking if he can put an in-haul transducer in his Boston Whaler Vantage spot where the manual calls out transducer location. Um, so I would probably want to double check. That is, yeah. that is more than likely a piece of solid fiberglass on that hull. Most Boston Whalers have that nice cord hull that makes them unsinkable. Uh, but I think in those transducer positions, those are usually solid. Um, specifically designed for a transducer, but you definitely probably want to check with the Marine Max service team um, before you uh, uh, install that transducer there, just to make sure it is what we think it is. And they should certainly have that info on file. That's a that's a good question by Ryan. I, I get yeah. this question a lot. We got Ryan Sharp asking, can the RV100 transducer be damaged if accidentally turned on while on land? Let's talk about that one specifically. And let's mm -hmm. talk about transducers in general. Are you gonna hurt it like if you're on your lift or you're on a trailer or, or whatever it may be? Yeah, so a transducer like the RV100, uh, no. Um, it's not gonna bother it at all uh, if it's out of the water for an extended period of time and it's transmitting. Um, the RV100 uses actually a fairly low power uh, transmitter. Um, one of the things that Ray Marine has done a lot of work on in the last uh, several years is we've generated a uh, low power sonar that performs extremely well in deep water. And it has to do with the digital processing that we use. Um, we don't have to use as much output power to go deep um, because we can make the receiver so sensitive and we can, do, we can digitally filter out a lot of the noise. Um, so our RV100, any of our CPTS transducers, and even most of the, I'd say 600 watt and under um, fish finding transducers, there's really no issues with those. Where you do have the potential for trouble is with uh, the one kilowatt and higher uh, transducers. So those uh, transducers do actually generate some heat in those ceramic elements. 
And normally they rely on the water that they're sitting in to keep them cool. Um, those can be damaged uh, if you were to accidentally leave it on uh, for an extended period of time. You can actually cook those elements and it'll damage the electronics inside. Um, Airmar Technology is a company that makes a lot of those high power transducers, um, not only for Raymarine, but a lot of other um, brands in the industry. Um, and they have some pretty nice information about that on their website over at airmar.com um, about specific models and kind of things to watch out for. But I'd say if you're running 1KW or higher, definitely be aware of that. One more. Good information. Yeah, one or two more here. So um, back at backtracking here, uh, Tim Nicholas says he has a 1992 322 Cuddy uh, Intrepid. His electronics are over eight years old. He would like recommendation on new Raymarine system. I would like a cost effective sonar, GPS, radar, and autopilot system. So, what kind of package would you put together for that guy? So what's really cool, Tim, is that um, even on an older boat like yours, um, there are options to get up to the latest technology, but you don't necessarily have to tear everything out and start over again. I mean, certainly if you want to do that, we'll, we'll gladly sell you all sorts of stuff, right? <laughs> uh, but we know that you know everybody has a budget. It really doesn't matter how much money you've got to spend. Everybody does have a budget. So if there are ways that you can save a little bit or upgrade in stages, um, that's that's certainly cool as well. Um, so um, I would take a look at our Axiom series. Those are our latest generation products. They come in uh, sort of three different tiers, uh, if you will. There's the basic Axiom Plus, which is a touch only product. Axiom Pro, which is a hybrid touch product. It adds some buttons and a keyboard and it has a more powerful sonar inside. And we have Axiom XL, which are our largest screens. They go 16 uh, up to 24 inches in size. And you can mix and match any combination of those. Um, but if you're going for cost effective, um, the Axiom or the Axiom Pro are pretty nice because the sonar is built into them. So you don't need a separate uh, module or an external black box to get all of this cool sonar that we've been talking about. Um, they do uh, down vision, side vision, chirp sonar, uh, and 3D all off of their built-in um, sonars. Um, and then the Axiom Pro units also have a one kilowatt uh, deep water sonar. So if you're going offshore fishing, um, that's also built in. Um, on the autopilot side of things, that's where there's probably the most potential to recycle uh, some products. So um, the latest generation of Raymarine pilots are called Evolution. And their, their heading sensor is actually the brain of the system. And there's a little electronics module that supports them called an ACU. Uh, but the actual part of the autopilot that steers the boat, so whether if you have hydraulic steering, it's a hydraulic pump. If you have mechanical steering, it could be a linear drive or a rotary drive. That part that's called a drive unit um, really hasn't changed in probably 30 years. Um, so those drive units, if they're in good working order, can usually be used on a modern pilot system. And that can save you quite a bit of money because you don't have to break into the hydraulic system. Um, the pumps or drive units themselves are, are fairly expensive items. Um, so that's a great place um, where you can recycle a part if it's working well uh, and keep going. Um, radar is something that you will probably upgrade. Um, most of the older radars uh, from 1992 were analog uh, systems. Um, radars of that vintage usually were very particular to a certain screen. So you had to have this antenna and this screen together, um, where modern radars now are digitally uh, connected to their screens and there's a lot more mix and match capability. So you would probably do a screen and a new radar at the same time. There you go. There's your answer. Blank, blank canvas. Uh, do with it what you will. Hey, uh, Sam Hunt, a while ago, this is a misconception. Well, it used to be, I do believe. Um, isn't Ray Marine Raytheon? Well, uh, at one time in our, in in our day. lifespan, we were, yes. <clears throat> so that is where the Ray and Raytheon comes from. We used to be part of Raytheon, which is a pretty big defense contractor. Uh, back around 2002, um, they actually sold us off to uh, venture capital or private equity. Um, we were our own independent company for a while. Uh, we had been listed on the UK stock exchange, the London stock exchange. Um, going back now about 12 years ago, we were acquired by FLIR Systems out of Portland, Oregon. Um, so for the, ago? yeah, it's been a while now. Yeah. Um, so we, we were part of FLIR for many, many years. Um, now, most recently, just um, within the last uh, 60 days, 
uh, FLIR was actually acquired by a, a bigger fish uh, called uh, Teledyne uh, Systems. Mm. They're out of uh, Thousand Oaks, California, Los Angeles area. So Ray Marine and FLIR are now all part of the Teledyne family. Interesting. So, a lot of corporate well, a lot history of there. Made in the marine industry. Yeah, I didn't know that. So I guess now that we're done through all the questions here, and I know that uh, we're coming up on time, but maybe if we can just we're not we're not having you give us any secrets or anything, <laughs> but if you could kind of give us a view here, one what to look out for. What 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 is the latest and greatest? Like like what is the number one thing that comes to your mind, Jim? when we're talking about the next big thing in marine electronics? You know, it's really all about integration. Um, we're yeah. always pulling in more capability, more of the boat systems interacting with that MFD. We realize that the MFD is more than just your chart plotter. Um, you know, it's more than just your fish finder. Um, it is really that center point that you spend, you know, other than looking through the windshield, you know, the next <laughs> biggest amount of time you, you or place you put your eyes is on that MFD. Um, so we want it to not only be the center of, of navigation and safety, uh, but it is the center for systems on board the boat. So whether it's monitoring your engines, whether it's monitoring, you know, camera feeds of things on the boat or around the boat, um, you know, it's, it's all there in that uh, MFD. Uh, what's really cool about our systems is that we make them upgradable too. So if you have Raymarine stuff and you do not regularly update your software, you're definitely missing out on a lot of new features and new technologies that we put in. A lot of them are free uh, updates. Well, the updates are always free. Sometimes it requires an, another piece of hardware or a sensor or something to take advantage of it, but um, there's tons and tons of new capability going in with every software release. Um, so definitely uh, update your machine if you've never done it. So speaking of software uh, updates and monitoring and controlling your MFD, I know in one of the updates that just came out, a, I don't know, a month or two ago, is the AnyDesk app? Uh, yes. Yeah. So if you if you go if you get your your Axiom there and you go into apps and if you've got the latest software update, there's going to be an AnyDesk icon. What's that all about? So AnyDesk is a piece of commercial software. It actually wasn't written by Ray Marine. It's something that um, is has been available in the market for a long time, but it allows you to remote in to another computer device. So with the AnyDesk app on your Axiom, that allows you to remote into your Axiom system uh, from anywhere in the world that you have an internet connection. So your boat, your boat has to have internet connectivity and wherever you're signing in from has to have internet connectivity. Um, a cool example of how we've used the AnyDesk app um, in our own Raymarine live broadcasts, uh, we've been able to do uh, some of our training sessions live uh, with a boat underway on Long Island Sound. And I'm looking at his radar live and his sonar, and, and I can even, with my mouse, control everything on his system from right here in the studio in New Hampshire. Um, but it's also a great, you know, as a training tool, you know, if you want to, um, you know, log in and, and use some of the systems on your Axiom remotely, you can do that. Um, if you ha are having trouble uh, with something, you know, your dealer or a technician could actually log in remotely to your Axiom, uh, adjust settings, they can uh, check software levels, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a uh, kind of a very multi-purpose tool. Uh, a lot of different ways you can use it, but uh, we're real excited to actually have it come standard now on the system uh, in the Raymarine apps. Well, I guess that's uh, I get I guess we're at four o'clock. I can't believe it's been a full hour. And man, I mean, we we could really talk every single week about this and just scratch the surface. I mean, we could really. We could really go on and on about marine electronics because it's always changing. I mean, it is. I mean, it's year to year. It's never the same. And that's what I think makes it so exciting. So with that being said, I, I think that as, uh, you know, being in the industry, we're always on our toes. You guys keep us on our toes. And it, it is an absolutely exciting time to, to just be around it, especially with the uh, with Marie Marine and the whole team. Absolutely. It really is. The, the technology is always advancing and um, there's always something new and exciting on the horizon. And uh, yeah, we're glad to be able to bring it to you. <laughs> well, Jim, I look forward to seeing you at Ibex down in uh, September. I know it was online last year. That's going to be a good show, the trade show here in Tampa. And really excited to see what you guys bring to the table and, and uh, get to get my hands on it. 
Excellent. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be a, a busy fall with uh, a lot of the boat shows that had gone offline oh, all, yeah. all coming back. Um, so we have uh, we have Ibex and we have a bunch of shows all up and down the eastern seaboard. And of course, uh, we'll be there at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show, too. Cool. Be before we sign off, we got Henry here that says, sorry, I missed your live meeting. It said 1.30 Eastern time. I'm Pacific time at 12.30. Miss out on your live show. Henry, not a problem. We get it. There's plenty of viewers that tune into the show live. You can catch it. Well, after it's live, still on Facebook, still on YouTube. You can download it on your podcast platform on your way home, whether that's Spotify, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, you name it, we're there. Guilty. I watch it myself sometimes when I'm stuck <laughs> in traffic or listen to them. What are you going to do? Right. And uh, just want to thank everybody for watching. A lot, a lot of viewers here on YouTube yep. today. Thanks for all the questions. Good questions. Participation. Good guests. Good hosts. What more can you ask for? <laughs> hey, Jim, thanks a lot, bud. I really appreciate it. It's great seeing you again and love to have you back on here. All right. Yeah, I'd love to make another appearance whenever you're ready for me. Uh, we're always here, ready for you guys. We love working with Marine Max. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. We'll see you guys next week, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Surprise guest. I do believe in our notes. We've got a real mystery. We've, we've got a real one this time, actually. We've got where is she? We've got Danelle. That's a couple weeks. Let's see. Where is it? <laughs> I was just looking at it. It's there somewhere. Oh well, stay tuned. Surprise we'll find out guest. who's here next there we week. Go. <laughs> we'll all learn together. Surprise guest <laughs> next week. So oh, no, she's the 28th. So. Yep. Awesome. See you guys next week. Thanks, Jim. See y'all. See you out on the water. Thanks, guys. All right.